Welcome to another episode of Mastermind Discussions. I'm your host, Matthew LaCroix, and today on episode number eight, I'm joined by legendary author and researcher Brian Forrester, who has written an astonishing 37 books about ancient history and lost civilizations, and has visited pyramids, temples, and megalithic structures around the world. Brian, thanks so much for coming on today. It's truly an honor to speak to you. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matthew. Thank you. So, Brian, for those who aren't familiar with your work um, and, and the things that you've studied and a lot of the, the books that you've written and the content, could you just give a, a brief history about, you know, what got you started on this, this road of traveling around the world and visiting all these sites and what got you interested in megalithic structures and, and ancient civilizations? Well, I've been fascinated by ancient enigmas since I was a little kid. And, uh, of course, probably the, the Sphinx in Egypt was... Um, was my, you know, the first one that um, I was looking at. My family, of course, got National Geographic when I was young. And so going through that every month was great. And I was able to go see Stonehenge when I was 16 uh, with a friend of mine. We, we traveled through uh, the British Isles for three weeks without any, um, any uh, parent or, or guardians, you know, we just freely moved around by, by train and stuff. And we actually got to walk to Stonehenge late uh, one afternoon. And there wasn't even a fence around it at that time. So you could literally walk up and touch the stones. Wow. So, but, but after that, Brian, after you, you know, got to visit Stonehenge and touch the stones and get to see some of those sites, what, what made you then want to get into visiting these, these structures and ruins around the world? Was there something that sparked um, your interest in seeking, you know, alternative information about, you know, wow, look at these megalithic structures that are so much more sophisticated on the bottom than they are on the top. How did that whole story get started? Well, it was the first day that I was in Cusco in Peru, and uh, I had a local guide who, you know, I thought was going to be an expert on this stuff. And so as we began to walk through the ancient uh, core of Cusco, I noticed that there were <clears throat> incredible sophisticated megalithic constructions like in in the background of your you know your monitor which is Oriente Tambo and then right next to it or on top of it much cruder work and so I asked you know who did all this work and my guide said the Inca and I said well some of that stuff would be very difficult for us if not impossible for us to do today so there must be a much more profound story and then when you look through the literature um, all the archaeologists say that the Inca built everything and that their finest craftsmen were the ones who did the megalithic work. And it's like, no, that, you know, they were a Bronze Age civilization. And bronze is softer than hard stone like, uh, like granite, etc. So there must, be, there must have been an older civilization. And so then I went back to Canada. And then six months later, I went back to Peru. And I just kept going to Peru every six months and then about 13 years ago i bought a one-way ticket and just moved to peru and just went well here we you know i i tend to do my my life path is based on my interest not based on financial security or anything so i just thought well maybe i can you know go to peru and survive and it's worked out very well well i just want to say i consider you the premier megalithic expert of the world. You know, there are many others, and I got to give credit to individuals like Graham Hancock and John Anthony West and Robert Schock and, and many others that have looked at places like the Sphinx enclosure and the weathering and looked at other sites. But I, in my opinion, there's no one else like you who has gone to so many of these sites and pointed out places where, hey, this doesn't really jive with what we're told in terms of one civilization being here and building it. And, and I want you to speak on this really quick, but I want to bring up one that I think is, uh, really bears a lot more expo exploration. And I almost was able to go visit that site, but due to COVID, I had to cancel my trip. Um, and that's Ushmal, down in, in, the, in the Mayan area of Mexico. You visited this site, and supposedly the Maya don't have as much megalithic um, structures as some of the other sites around the world. And, and my personal opinion on that is because of the type of rock that was present there. But I wanted to get your take on something like the Temple of the Wizards and the, how you break down the name Ushmal itself, perhaps meaning built three times, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, we were very fortunate that uh, our local guide, 
<clears throat> was fluent in Nahual, which is the Aztec language, but he also understands a lot of uh, Maya. So I, you know, I, I, whenever we'd go to a site, I'd ask him, what's the original name of the place? Because that's key, no matter what country you go to, whether it's Peru or Egypt or Mexico. And he said, it means built three times. And so I just thought, well, let's have a look. And as we walked around, I could see three levels of construction. There's uh, the, like the Spanish conquistador style, and then the Mayan, and then clearly there was a, a megalithic core to some of the structures, because you see these like massive beams, um, you know, very tight fitting together, which the, the Maya probably couldn't have done, just like the Inca couldn't have done certain things. So again, you know, it's much more subtle in Mexico, but many different sites show that there were original builders there long before the cultures that we think of. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And those pieces have really, when you, when you identified saying, Hey, look at, look at the, the sophistication on this upper level and then look at the sophistication on some of these pieces in the lower level, being someone like me who has done a fair bit of studying um, everything from geology all the way to looking at the, the Masonic, design of these structures and looking at creating, um, you know, precise building, I immediately was captivated by you pointing them out. To me, it was very, very obvious, um, especially in places, I think the, probably the best example of anywhere in the world that shows this, or at least one of the best, in my opinion, is probably Machu Picchu, where you have these very, very clean, um, easy to see, less primitive um, with mortar built, built in on the upper levels. And then on the bottom, we have these incredibly um, precise, sophisticated building to the point where, and I completely agree with what you said when you first came on, you know, could we even do this now? And so I wanted to ask you, all of these sites around the world, putting them all together, what does this say about our history? And do we need to rewrite the history books? Yeah, well, what we do know now scientifically is that there were a series of cataclysms that occurred between about 13,000 and 12,000 years ago that was global. It might have even have, have altered the axis of the planet. And so um, <clears throat> that puts our history back to at least uh, in terms of sophistication twice as long as what most academics say, because they say that a approximately 6,000 years ago you had the rise of certain civilizations, like in Samaria and Egypt and places like that, but this at least doubles it, if not more. And they simply disregard the obvious physical evidence that uh, you know that we're I and many others are showing. And when you look at places like Ahu Vinapu in Easter Island, and you see the sophistication on that wall segment, which is another place that I was going to go and I had to cancel because of COVID, unfortunately. And then you look at places in Peru with the building you see in places like Cusco and in, in the background here, Ole Te Tambo. Is, is that evidence enough to show that those cultures likely had inf at least influences of each other more than 3,000 miles away, right? Um, yeah, it is possible because, um, yeah, the site you mentioned, there are actually four or five on Easter Island, uh, Vinapu being one of them where you have very tight fitting basalt blocks. And the, uh, the Easter Islanders, you know, that we think of didn't even have Bronze Age technology. They were more or less a Stone Age people. So they had no way of being able to do that work. So it's clear there that uh, the Polynesians arrived one to 2,000 years ago and that certain structures were there, just like when the Inca arrived in Cusco 1,000 years ago, certain structures were there. And they simply incorporated them into, um, you know, into their culture. And, and, of course, in Egypt as well, the Great Pyramid, places like the Serapium, where you have these giant granite boxes. <clears throat> and recently, I was able to go under the Step Pyramid at uh, Saqqara, and there's a whole megalithic complex underground that the dynastic people built on top of. So what, it, and that's a great point that you brought up. I, I'm glad you did. So many of these structures, especially in Egypt, seem to be when we're looking at the megalithic, megalithic sophisticated structures, they, most of them seem to be on the bottom, even some ways below ground level. And the only, I think some of the examples that break that rule is places like the Great Pyramid above the King's Chamber with some of the blocks in there. 
-hmm. but what what's your take on places like the Osirion and a lot of other locations where we seem to have this need to build down the lower levels down where the aquifers perhaps are you know what what was do you what was your in your in your opinion based on what you've studied what was the purpose of building such a low level like that well that's the really curious question because even <clears throat> some egyptologists now will um, admit that 85 percent of ancient egypt um, is is yet to be revealed to the world and it's all underground like built on purpose underground and that's the you know that's the curious thing thing and of course you also find no hieroglyphics in general on the oldest stru of, of structures and their timelines are you know just they're just guessing it at during what dynasty or, or um, period that these things were made like the Osirion it's like it's an underground complex and right next to it is the huge temple of Seti the first which is above ground so again it's another example of, of where um, they're trying to mislead us by giving us names of pharaohs who would have built something without any actual factual um, tr truth to it. And I had the great <clears throat> fortune in March of having the Osirion to myself for half an hour. So it came completely unexpectedly. I, you know, I, I went and asked our guide, are we allowed to go down? No, there are guys with guns. It's like, no. And then all of a sudden, this uh, one of the guards came up to me and he said, follow me. And he led me down the staircase, took the barbed wire back from the staircase that goes down. And I got to wander around. It's a very complex, uh, it's much more complicated than what most people think if they know of the Osirion at all. But you see this, you know, this basically this um, courtyard built underground. And most people think that's it. But when you go to the right, you go inside this very big chamber with a, a corbelled roof like that. And then when you go to the other end, there's a tunnel that goes off to the right, like hundreds of feet long and ends with a, a metal grid. And you look beyond it, you see there's a staircase leading somewhere, but it's locked. So you, you can't, um, you can't go through there at the moment, but um, it's a very complex place. Another place is the Osiris shaft that I've been able to go in twice, which is a, an underground complex, you know, a supposed uh, tomb of Osiris, which is nonsensical, or even a symbolic tomb, which, may, which doesn't mean anything. And it's, you know, it goes 200 feet down into the bedrock. And uh, there's no way that the dynastic people would have constructed that. They inherited it. And it's only been open to the public now by special permission for, I think, about two years now. You pay $2,400 and you get the place for two hours. That's amazing, Brian. I, that would be an incredible experience to be able to, to go down there, let alone in there at, at all, but with, with it to yourself without you know, a bunch of tourists all around you really would be a magical experience that I would love to share sometime. But I, I'm curious, you mentioned Osiris and that these boxes or tombs are more of a symbolic tomb, as in they're just, they're solid granite, right? They're solid, Mm -hmm. They're a solid material. So I wanted to ask you, um, I guess just your opinion or based on what you've looked at, why would it, an advanced, sophisticated civilization like this build these structures and then build these boxes that have a symbolic value? That, that's a lot of work. What do you think was the purpose of it? Well, in the case of a lot of the boxes, um, you know, these boxes weigh up to 100 tons and each one is made out of like the lid and the box are made out of one piece of stone because they also have other examples inside the Cairo Museum and outside the Cairo Museum brought in from different, lo different locations. I think mainly from Saqqara, though. Saqqara is one of the largest um, archaeological sites in the world. Most of it is off limits still, but certain areas are open. And um, where the Serapium, where there are 20... 25 of these boxes, two of them unfinished, uh, just massive in scale. <clears throat> Somehow there, whoever did the work had to have had artificial light because if they don't turn the lights on when we go there, it's completely pitch black and there's barely a foot uh, of space to be able to turn the box to, to go down different corridors with them. And there's also a side chamber down at, at one end, which is locked. 
And fortunately, one time we were there and the guard opened, opened it up for us. And we got to go into another, see another series of boxes. And he said, it keeps going. Like there's another, another door that's locked. And he said, no, you can't go through there. But he said, it keeps going and going and going. So these places are much bigger than what most people realize. That's incredible. So like, like you said earlier on, um, as much as the Great Pyramid of Giza is magnificent, and, and it is, but there may be some of the greatest secrets in Egypt are actually below the ground. Um, and I wanted to get your take on the purpose of some of these tunnel systems that connect to places like the Sphinx, because some people aren't aware, but you can see very noticeable entrances from both the top of the head as well as the paw and the backside where there's even images of Zahi Hawass going down the stairs in there being like, nothing to see here, basically, right? And I'm just curious, of, it's curious about your opinion about those tunnel systems and what was the purpose of create, connecting something like the Great the Sphinx to something like the Great Pyramid of Giza and some of the other things like the Tomb of the Birds and some other locations? Well, yeah, the interesting thing is that um, some people speculate, like I think John Anthony West speculated that the Sphinx is probably 36,000 years old. So it's not simply 12,000. It's like he thinks it's one and a half processional cycles. And uh, Robert Shark, <clears throat> you know, he, he changes his statement every once in a while. I think he's up to 12,000 years old now. But still, that's twice as old as the dynastic people. And also the causeway that goes from the Great Pyramid down to the Sphinx is built at an angle. Normally, the, the causeway would be 90 degrees from the flat surface of the, of the pyramid. So it, it appears that the Great Pyramid was built after the Sphinx. And the reason for the angle was to miss the Sphinx because they couldn't go through it. Um, also, the tunnel system seems to be... It's north, south, east, and west, and it goes several stories underground. I've been four stories underground so far, but I've been told it goes at least 10, if not 20 stories down. And it's also believed that uh, uh, sites like Saqqara, which um, again is a massive location, that there's a tunnel system there that goes at least as far as the Giza Plateau that we, that we think of, because um, Abdel Hakim Awiyan, who was a, an elder who died uh, some years ago, he was he was filmed in a, a series called The Pyramid Code, and he stated that when he, when he was young, he was able to go from Saqqara underground to Giza um, by crawling, swimming, and walking upright. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that the exact location where the shaft is that he went down has been covered in concrete. So you know, again, this is a way for academics to try to hide the evidence of what's actually there. So Brian, it's so hard when you hear statements like that to not use that capital C word, that capital C word of conspiracy. It's very difficult and, I, and it's, you know, it's for those who go down that road, you get labeled automatically when you start talking about this, but how can one hear what you just said? countless times, right? These passages get closed up. They get cemented. You were visiting tunnel systems underneath the Giza, showing these incredible video, video of these places. Places like the Tomb of the Birds were discovered, and then they were exploring it, and then bars got put up right in the middle of the exploration. All these different um, moments keep happening where it seems like this information is being deliberately, I guess, covered up. Do you think that's just to protect this narrative that we have of history because it's too difficult to want to change it? I'm just curious, without getting too deep down that road, what's your opinion about why they do this? Well, I think they're, they're still trying to defend a paradigm, and the paradigm is that everything was built by the dynastic people. <clears throat> but the megalithic stuff clearly shows that that was not possible. So gradually what's happening now, thanks to you know, videos I make and, and what other people are, are making, it shows the obvious evidence that there were at least two construction periods, the dynastic period um, and the pre-dynastic. And you know, it's the difference between night and day. So the more we're able to film and expose this stuff, the more the general public is starting to catch on. And it will make Egypt a much more fascinating place to visit once this, you know, this pandemic thing gets, uh, gets finished with. Uh, I think pe people will go to Egypt not simply for the, pharaonic stuff but for this other narrative that we're um, exposing 
that, uh, you know, there's all this stuff. Even some of the Egyptologists admit that only 15% of ancient Egypt um, is open to the public. 85% is still locked and, is un and it's all underground. That's why when you go to the Giza Plateau, <clears throat> you'll see door, you know, lots of different doorways that are sealed shut with, uh, with metal doors. But gradually the authorities in Egypt are slowly starting to open some of these things up, like the Osiris shaft, as I mentioned earlier. That was never open to the public until I think it was two years ago. And uh, other places like the Serapium at Saqqara, most people who visit Egypt don't even go there because the guides don't want to pay the extra fee or the tour company doesn't want to pay the extra fee uh, to go into it. But it's one of the most mind boggling places there, there is on the planet. I got to say, I really feel like uh, between Egypt and Peru and Bolivia, those two locations have so many megalithic secrets and, and underground places that you could almost spend a lifetime exploring them. And I'm encouraged by the work that you are doing and many others to change this paradigm, as you, as you said. This paradigm of history that's tightly controlled as far back as perhaps the Roman Empire. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that paradigm changing now? Do you see any, any hints of that changing? Yeah, I do. And actually the guide we had uh, in March, I can't actually mention his name because he's working on his PhD right now. And he knows about the ancient, he knows the difference between dynastic and dynastic, but he can't, he can't say anything about it on camera. So I had to be very careful just to film him at the dynastic sites and let him talk about Horus and Osiris and stuff like that. But he would pull me off to the side every once in a while and tell me about this stuff that is hidden there that he has seen himself, including a huge megalithic complex underneath the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara. He said it's like an under, underground city uh, that he was able to see once when he was much younger. And he believes that uh, the new uh, people in charge of the uh, antiquities in Egypt will gradually open more and more of these places up simply because they want, A, they want the revenue, B, they want the tourists to come back, and C, um, some of the younger Egyptologists know that there is the pre-dynastic stuff, and gradually they're starting to talk about that. So that's changing the paradigm away from the controlling aspects uh, of people like Zahi Hawass, who, who of course knew all of this stuff, but he would emphatically state, um, you know, that all of it had to have been done by the dynastic people. Uh, a few days ago, supposedly Elon Musk uh, sent out a tweet saying that the, the Great Pyramid was built by aliens and automatically Zahi Hawass had to make a video saying, how dare you, you know, um, say such a thing because obviously the dynastic people did, but he, you know, he's lying through his teeth. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, to say he's not a hero of mine is probably an understatement. But I, um, since you brought it up, it, I, I got to ask, because people are going to say, Matt, come on, you got to ask. You know, you've been on the show Ancient Aliens a bunch of, uh, quite a few times. I am the per a type of person who um, has a different type of perspective. I don't use the word alien. I, I study things like, you know, who were these ancient gods, whether or not they were just symbolic or, or what. But I just wanted to get your take. These structures were built by, a, a very, we can obviously agree these structures were built by a sophisticated civilizations, if not a civilization, who mm -hmm. had incredible knowledge about even potentially things like the diameter of our planet and even potentially the distance away from our sun. Do you think, um, I guess you can answer this however you're comfortable with, but what is your perspective on where this knowledge came from? Well... The more I see it, the more I look at these places, like I've been to Egypt eight times, I've been to Machu Picchu, I think 83 times, I've been to Oyente Tambo, which is behind you, more than 100 times, and the more that I visit these places, the more obvious it becomes that you have these two different construction styles, and as we know, some of this stuff would be very hard for us to do with modern 21st century machines. In some cases, uh, we couldn't replicate this stuff. So I'm open to the idea that it was an ancient, advanced 
technological civilization that came and visited and constructed and then left. Maybe they left because of the cataclysmic activity. Um, and also, so everything seems to have been pragmatic. Like, uh, you know, what's behind you is, is part of what's called the Temple of the Sun at Oyente Tambo. And that's something that the Inca named it because they found it damaged in place and then they built all around it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think more and more that it was off-world visitors rather than being an advanced ancient civilization because we have no actual evidence of anything like so-called Atlantis. You know, people keep saying Atlantis is in the Atlantic or it's in Quebec or it's in, you know, here, there, or it's Antarctica or whatever, but we don't have any actual evidence of their existence. So I think, yeah, the more I, I visit, the more... I'm very much open to the idea that it was visitors who came and built for some pragmatic reason, these, what we think of as energetic structures or structures that are very sensitive to vibration and energy. And uh, they had the capability uh, in the case of, for example, Oyente Tambo, to be able to manipulate matter, like to make it soft very temporarily as if it was marshmallow material. And the, so then the stones would basically perfectly fit each other because it was temporarily made soft. And the, the mountain from which the stone of Ointe Tambo um, comes from is across the valley and on top of a mountain. So how could the Inca, have tran how could they have cut and transported blocks that weigh up to 70 tons? There's just no way. It, that's absolutely amazing. And to me, it's so obvious that we're talking about some, some uh, a culture or cultures that were so sophisticated that they had understandings that we don't even have today. And mm -hmm. I, I find that to be incredibly amazing considering that we're told in our, you know, official history books that were given that these were all built by the Inca, you know, less than 5,000 years ago. And that's the whole story and there's nothing else to it. But like you said, when we're talking about precision, we're talking about structures that were so precise that, like I said before, we perhaps couldn't even build them today with some of the finest masons that are around. I know that you, I believe you had met when, and talked to some when you were um, explaining or trying to understand places like Tiwanaku or Pumapunku. And mm -hmm. some of them, I think, I think you did this quite a few years ago, but some of them came back and were like, I don't even think I could do this with some of the tools and machinery I have today, right? Yeah, well, that's very true. There, we've had quite a few stonemasons and geologists and engineers and people like that, uh, you know, professionals in specific fields come and explore these sites with us in person. And they all say the same thing. They say, there's no way that culture could have done it. So there had to have been someone with much more sophisticated technology, much farther back in time that did it. And the other thing is most of these places, every stone is unique in terms of, of its shape and size, and we don't approach construction that way. We, we like to have one uniform thing, like a brick or something, and whoever was building this stuff were, you know, just like, well, this, I need a piece shaped like this, and it goes there, then I need a piece like this, and it, and it goes there, and it's not, a, it's not what we would think of as a logical way to build, but the evidence is, you know, there. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to me for me to wrap my head around, you know, exactly what the purpose of these structures were. And I want to expand on a concept and get your it, build up to where we can try to maybe together discuss, you know, why they would have built them like this. For example, um, one of the things that's I think one of the greatest examples to bring up to connect all of this that we could we sort of scratch your head wondering you know how the heck something like that could have been done is when you one of my favorite favorite videos is when you explored the karnak temple complex and you were pointing out how there are places within egypt especially in karnak and a few others where there are st these stone blocks that seem to come from a very very far distance away for instance one of them you identified, you, using a, a fellow geologist you were working with, this massive travertine block that is a type of material that doesn't come from even potentially Africa. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, suppose, she believes that uh, the nearest location would be Turkey. So, you know, that's moving stuff, uh, you know, a big distance. And then, of course, the, all of the stuff, uh, the granite, most of the granite seems to have come from Aswan. 
transported hundreds of miles to the north. Some people say, or the standard idea is that the, the um, Egyptians built giant barges to, to transport these stones and the obelisks and stuff. But there are no trees that grow in Egypt uh, of any size that you can use to build a boat out of. So they had, the material for the boats and barges would have to be brought in. And that's you know a distance of at least a thousand miles. So um, yeah, that's the puzzling thing. There's a, you know, one of the largest statues that ever existed in the world was located at the, an area called the Ramesseum, which is in Thebes. And it was one piece of stone weighing a thousand tons. And it, it was a, a seated figure of, of a human being. And now it's, you know, it got blown into, into many fragments. Um, some say that, that the damage happened during the historical time period, but I don't believe that. I think it's uh, much, much older. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. That's a great area for us to expand on. I wanted to say that um, w along the lines of in Thebes, let's stay in Thebes here, um, the, the Colossi of Memnon in the Theban necro necropolis is these two statues are mind boggling to me because you know they're they're 60 feet tall each which some people might understand how tall 60 feet is it's, it's enormous and they're estimated to be 720 tons each and of course that comes from your videos but one of the things i want to ask you is um and it may be something that you've mentioned before but i you know i've gone into google earth and gone right down into those statues and you know sort of moved the camera around and, and looked at where the damage was done this vitrification on the statues and i'm finding a uh that a, a measurement or a pointing north northeast on each one of these statues and many other structures around the world do you find a common direction where you're seeing damage come from and, and what does that say to you yeah, the damage there and at other locations in Egypt, like at Karnak, it appears to have come, something came from the east. And, uh, you know, Robert Schock's idea is that it's plasma ejection from the sun. Uh, the or the um, geologist we use, most often Susan, believes that the, the stone was scorched with at least 2,000 degrees Celsius uh, heat, like a flash burning. And so the, the front of the two colossi um, are more damaged than the sides and the back are almost intact. And then their orientation is actually 23 degrees off north, south, east, and west. And almost any civilization or culture knows how to figure out where north, south, east, and west are. So that again insinuates that the axis of the planet shifted dur during the series of uh, cataclysmic activities. And then, interestingly enough, behind the Colossi and off to the right is where the 1,000 ton statue uh, is located or the fragments of it. And it's scorched on his backside. So it looks like he was facing into the Valley of the Kings. And so this force came and burnt, you know, burnt the back. And you can tell because the way the granite is falling apart is not the way that granite normally does. It's peeling off in layers, and that indicates that the surface was flash heated and that, you know, parts of it have been, it's still peeling off to this day, and that would have blown the whole thing into, into fragments. Um, so, yeah, we see that at Karnak, we see that at the Ramesseum, and a site in the Nile Delta called Tanis, which is one of the most bizarre locations on Earth. It, it looks, it's a hill, but it looks like the whole thing was scorched with heat, because it can't um, sustain plant life. And this is the Nile Delta where most of the food of Egypt is grown. So you have this weird hill that comes out of nowhere, uh, you know, because most of the area is completely flat. And uh, that's the site of Tanis, which we've been to twice so far. So let's try to understand this. We have this north or east direction or um, coming from, it seems like this damage is, has directed itself from, where we're seeing intense vitrification of these very, very hard granite blocks, causing them to literally melt or break apart into pieces um, from extreme heat. So we know that that is the factor that caused that, okay? So let's mm -hmm. build off of that. If there's a certain direction and a certain type of heat that had to create that, do you think that that do you subscribe to someone like Graham Hancock's perspective of some kind of a cosmic impact? Or do you think, which is, which is what I actually believe as well, that it was um, 
more of like a, a, a great solar outburst, some kind of a, an, an event where it had an impact on not only extreme heat, but also a, a movement of the poles, or could a movement of the poles also happen from a cosmic strike? What's your, what's your feelings and take on that? Well, I guess that, you know, that's, that's what I cover in my book, Aftershock, where I look at, at all these ancient locations. And uh, they're, you know, they're different theories. They all talk about the same time period. They all talk about approximately 13,000 years ago. Um, you know, you have one theory, which is Robert Shock's about the solar uh, plasma from the sun. Then you have um, Paul Laviolette, who's an American physicist, who talks about ejection from the galactic center that the, uh, the black hole that's in the center of our galaxy uh, actually fills up over time and then will suddenly uh, almost like burp or, or emit uh, a massive amount of, of energy that goes across the galactic plane, which could have gone through the sun, which could have, could have caused the solar uh, plasma effect, and that this happens every 13,000 years approximately, so twice every processional cycle. And so those are, the, are kind of the prevailing theories. Other people talk about a comet or an asteroid. A, a massive asteroid was recently found in Greenland that was uh, like nickel, iron, uh, and uh, a mile in diameter, which is a huge asteroid. And that was discovered, I think, less than two years ago. Um, but, so but Brian, I, isn't I that ice older than the supposed age of this event? So therefore, it would preclude... The, having a cosmic impact in somewhere like Greenland? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, the, the dates that they stated, I think that this impact could have happened between 13,000 and like 100,000 years ago oh, okay. or something. But it, it is within, you know, it is within the, uh, the boundary of that. But um, I think it was a combination of all sorts of different things. I think uh, our planet was, was, you know, battered by all sorts of different activity for a thousand years, and that's would have uh, decimated um, any population centers. Like uh, you're talking about heat that would vaporize uh, plant life and human, you know, humans and animals, and then make these areas uninhabitable for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And so, I think that's another reason why uh, that the dynastic people repopulated what we call Egypt now, like five to six thousand years ago that they were you know prohibited from doing it anyone was prohibited <clears throat> before that for a long time because of this um literally scorched earth thing that happened and that's where tanis again comes into play because uh the excavations there i think first started taking place about a hundred years ago and everything there is megalithic i mean it's like uh there are 13 different obelisks that you find there all snapped into pieces so that site was, you know, looked like, looks like it was nuked. Um, and then the dynastic people discovered it and took some of those giant blocks and, you know, built some kind of crude walls out of it. But you see stone quartzite there, which is uh, very high in silica, and it's melted. So depending on the type of stone, uh, the heat effect is different. With granite, it, it makes it explode, basically. Uh, the same thing with travertine. Travertine tends to explode if you heat it very quickly, and quartzite melts. So there's a, a couple of figures there, human-looking figures, where you look at the toes, and the, the toes are literally melted. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I try to, you know, studying this like you do, I try to envision what this event or events must have been like, and I, I almost have to shake my head at the idea that we probably can't even comprehend the scale and the magnitude, like Randall Carlson says, the different magnitudes of these disasters on the earth, you know, what kind of scale um, to measure? Do you think that this was a global event or did it hit key points on the planet? I, I think it, it, uh, I think it was global in nature. And um, it just so happens that the megalithic sites that we find, you know, in, you know, mainly in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, Jordan, um, Lebanon, Jerusalem is a recent find. There's a tunnel system under under the western wall of Temple Mount that's got like a 600-ton block in it and stuff. 
this it's that general area or those general areas where you had sophisticated cultures existing um, way in the distant past and so each one of those sites has been uh, hit by some kind of cataclysmic damage so um, yeah I think it was global in nature and uh, as far as I can tell I've, I've visited most of the ancient megalithic sites except uh, someday I, I would like to go to India because there's so much there but right now of course is not the time to go anywhere so yeah, some of the sites in India, like Barbar Hill Caves, yeah. uh, Elephanta yeah. Island, um, and Kanhari Caves, just incredible basalt carvings out of the rock with these ancient temples that really just um, shows you that this this knowledge and this these advanced cultures were covering a, a, a much wider area than we might we might believe. You know, it's not just you know thinking about Egypt and Peru, but we have to add in places like. Petra Jordan and Nashe yeah. Rostam and Persepolis and Iran and then looking even places like I don't know if you're familiar with Kinnis Rock in Iraq just these places where you know these sheer cliffs are just carved out with such precision that it really begs the question you know what kind of tools were th were these and I and I want to expand on that and get your 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 um your take but one of the things sure. that you brought up in your videos that is absolutely mind boggling to me is when you go to the Aswan quarry in Egypt and you show the areas where a lot of these stones were taken for much of Egypt, and you point out how there are these very odd scoop marks in the, the granite itself where it seems like these blocks were scooped out and then reshaped. What kind of tool could have scooped out granite like that? Do you have, what's your take on that? Uh, well, honestly, you know, some people think it was some kind of machine with a conveyor belt or something like that, or like a front end loader that you know was digging away. I, th I think it was a, it was a tool that was vibrational in nature, and uh, it was tuned to the frequency to disrupt um, quartz because there's a, a pretty high concentration of quartz crystal in that uh, that granite, and so I think it was almost like a like a pulse or vibrational tool that didn't actually come in contact with the stone itself, but it just looks like it had a, a width of about two feet and an, uh, like an arc shape because it's deeper, you know, the scoops are deeper in the center and it simply would pass like up and down and then cause the, um, you know, cause the hard material to turn into, into dust or powder. It's, it's so odd and then at the same time we find these what look like very obvious drill holes in places like South America and Egypt where it looks like some kind of a diamond bit drill was used but that would have been you know according to our you know school books of having civilization only 6000 years old and using bronze age tools those structures would have been impossible to cut and 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 manipulate like that correct no absolutely i mean diamond Diamond encrusted tools were first invented for the mining industry in, in the US in the 1860s, I think. So there, will, there was no technology that could do that before that time. And, uh, you know, people come up with this idea that, you know, if you had a, 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 like a bronze saw and you had a, a bunch of powdered diamond or something and you, you worked on it long enough that you'd wind up being able to make these cuts. But that's just, that's absolutely foolish. To think of so we're talking about yeah technology we have today that uh, existed several thousand years ago and um, there's one site in Egypt called Abu Sir which is not very often visited it's got more drill holes than anywhere else of different uh, diameters uh, you, you can see the spiral uh, you know clockwise spiral way that the tool was going through the material and um, some estimates are that the, the cutting ability of, of those tools were 500 times more efficient than a modern diamond drill. So you're talking about a material, a cutting material that doesn't exist on our planet that we know of. Uh, like it's, it's not the speed of penetration, it's the efficiency of penetration, which is it's, a different thing. I mean, how do, we, how do we wrap our heads around the fact that these sophisticated cultures had not only knowledge of aspects of energy consciousness in our planet and all these things that we are either just discovering now or haven't even discovered yet but they had these tools that are in some ways like you said more efficient than we have today as what we consider this modern technologically advanced civilization 
but yet they had things that were even more advanced than we are now. So the question is, when you look at these locations and they're traveling over a thousand miles to find a travertine block blocks to bring down to put in these temples, and then they're traveling over 400 miles to the south to Aswan to get these, these granite blocks in many cases. What do you think the purpose of needing to go to these great distances to acquire them? Was it because of their silica content? Uh, yeah, I think um, all of the stone that seems to have been used, like basalt and granite, <clears throat> tend to have a high quartz crystal content. And so obviously there was some reason I think some kind of vib vibrational property or energetic property of the of the quartz that uh, meant that they would go as far as required in order to be able to obtain the material that they wanted for specific uh, purposes. Like again, with the Colossi of Memnon, those are are made of quartzite. Uh, the one on the left is is relatively intact. The one on the right was supposedly rebuilt by the Romans, like very poorly in the early, uh, early centuries um, after the death of Christ, I guess you could say. And the quarry for those uh, blocks are in Cairo. So that's like 400 miles that they had to be moved. One, you know, probably the original blocks were 1,000 tons each. So how would you transport that? You can't build a boat to do that. You know, so again, you know, it's becoming... The good thing is, is uh, the more that people watch these videos, the more that they go and visit themselves, these locations, it just, it reinforces the story. Like, it's not my story. It's just, I've been to these locations so many times. Um, we've never had anyone come with us who's been able to say, yes, I think the Inca did that, or yes, I think that the Egyptians did that. It's like, nobody's come away from uh, experiencing these places and have been able to say that they all go oh my god you know it's and of course it's much more incredible to go to these places than it is to to see pictures or videos but you know most people either can't afford or, or physically can't go to these locations um so yeah it's becoming more and more obvious and just through um through time and through uh people watching this stuff more and more people are, are becoming convinced that there's a lot more to our history than what we've been taught and that uh, these paradigms are crumbling as the academics are not able to back up their statements like they can't show how a bronze tool could do the work um, you know on a hard stone like granite and so um, you know their paradigm is disappearing and, and the new uh, the younger academics that are coming up they see this stuff, they see it themselves. They see that the, the nature of, of, of the history is much more complex than what their professors taught them. And now they talk in secret about it, but gradually they'll start opening up and tell the world that you know, our history is much more complex and uh, much grander than what, uh, what we think or, or what we used to think. Yeah, and I certainly welcome that new paradigm coming in. That's, that's why, you know, individuals like you and many, many others. And as myself, we work so hard to expose and, and just show the world that look, look at this. This is, this completely changes our entire story. This completely changes our understanding of ancient history and had the rise and fall, it seems of sophisticated civilizations becoming less sophisticated every single time until before long, instead of thinking that things are in a linear way, like we've been told where, where we've advanced from A to B now, and we're the most advanced ever. It doesn't seem like that's the case. It seems like it's been more of this slow um, rise and fall until before long, like after these cataclysms of the Younger Dryas um, 12 to 13,000 years ago, it seemed like civilization here lost a tremendous amount of knowledge. And every and we've, instead of going up, we've almost gone backwards in, in, our, in our knowledge and understanding of balance. So do you, do you see, um, you know, a lot of merit in studying these structures in a way where we can almost learn about our, our previous selves to maybe relook at where we are now and, and, and change our perspectives a little bit about what our place is in the cosmos and what, it, you know, what we are here, what we're doing here? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's quite a humbling thing because when you can see that there were 
<laughs> people are beings capable of doing things that we can't, it, you know, it grounds you back to earth that we are not the most sophisticated life forms that have ever existed here. You know, maybe it was our ancestors, maybe it was someone else. But uh, yeah, for me, it's a, it's a very humbling feeling to stand next to these things and just, uh, you know, try to figure out how they, how it was done and look at the, uh, at the almost impossibility of their construction. That's what's, uh, that's what's awe-inspiring um, to visit these places. I want to get your, your thoughts on one more area as we sort of conclude our analysis of these megalithic lost civilizations. When you look in places like in the, in the back of me, Ole Te Tambo, especially in places like Peru, we don't really see that in a lot of other places. We find these, these knobs that were deliberately carved in, in, on these stones themselves, which seem to have some kind of a potential energetic or harmonic purpose. And at the same time, when you map something like ley lines, these energetic convergence zones around the, the world, we find that now they're not quite on, on the spots where these sites are, but they, they're close. And doesn't that, doesn't that sort of give you some information when you look at the fact that if we had a pole shift and things moved around to where energetic ley lines may be in a different location now, does that give us any information to help us understand why they were built in the first place? Well, that's the curious thing. I'm sure you're aware of the, the videos that show that um, the, um, the, the present equator um, in the distant past, uh, there was a different equator that was at an angle of, I think, 19 degrees. And that if you plot the ancient sites, they, they're all either on or very close to that ancient equator. So started Easter, like you go from Easter Island to the town of Paracas, which is where I'm at in Peru. That's where the elongated skull people lived. Then from there, you go to Machu Picchu and Oyente Tambo. And then you go to the Great Pyramid. And then you go to Mahanjadaro, you know, in Pakistan. And so they all seem to have been built on this, this uh, ancient equator. Also in Peru and Bolivia, there's another line that comes at an angle like that. It's called the Path of Viracocha, and all of the megalithic sites are located on that line, like Machu Picchu, Oyente Tambo, uh, Temple of the Sun in uh, Lake Titicaca, uh, Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, and you know, on and on and on it goes. It goes down into Chile, but that's, that was a relatively recent um, discovery. We also had some people who were very talented at, uh, at dowsing with, with rods, uh, on this one tour we had, we had six of them, and one of them was incredibly sensitive at being able to figure out the band or, or the width of, of what these lines were, um, energetic lines, something like, you know, at Machu Picchu, something like 300 feet across. Um, he had some kind of nervous condition, which actually made him able to be very sensitive to, you know, most people think dowsing rods are BS or whatever, but he was incredible at being able to... Uh, Manipulate or to to sense these things, even like male and female um, sub energy energy bands going back and forth. So that that was actually that was quite intriguing. So if these sites are located, um, like we think of Giza, right? It's supposed to be the geographic center of the planet, and these sites yeah. are on this ancient equator system, and they have uh, an energetic harmonic purpose. Okay, let's just let's say that that's what they are. Uh -huh. And is, would you say that these would potentially have been built, because we don't have any writings on them, right? There's no hieroglyphs on them. That, that no. They're obviously not the purpose that the, the ancient um, pharaohs of Egypt had for, for what we think of as them. So were, do you think that they were potentially built as some kind of a balancer of energy if these ancient people had known that these cataclysms happen and that there's pole shifting that leads to these incredible disasters, right? Would that potentially imply that they knew that those could happen and that maybe they were building these to prevent the severity of those events? What is your take on that? Yeah, something like that. Um, you know, some, some of the sites, we don't know how old they are. You know, they're probably 13,000 plus, but we can't say how, you know, can't say how old they are. Uh, but they're pre-cataclysmic. The curious thing is, again, that a number of them are, the orientation is about 23 degrees off north, south, east, and west. So that suggests that the axis of the Earth shifted 
And, uh, but the, the great pyramids on the Giza Plateau, they're oriented within something like three degrees uh, or three degrees of arc or something like that from perfect orientation north, south, east, and west. So I think the, the Giza uh, Plateau pyramids were built either during the cataclysm or, or right after the cataclysm by who, you know, who knows. And that, that, that complex was built as a stabilizing co energetic complex for the planet. And that's why it, it was located at the ge geographic center of the planet. You know, that's, that's very curious. And the other one seemed to have been energetic in some kind of way, but what the actual function was, whether it was harnessing or focusing or amplifying earth energy or, or what, that's kind of the theory that we're, I think, that, that we're looking at now. But for yeah. what use, you know, to expand consciousness maybe or to create uh, localized um, force fields of some kind or energetic fields, you know, again, it's something that is so enigmatic. And the knobs themselves, like the standard story is that the knobs were uh, put there on purpose so that uh, the ancient Inca, for example, could lift the stones up and put them into place. And then when you say some of the biggest ones don't have knobs, then the archaeologists say, well, the Inca cut those ones off. And it's like, no, because some of the biggest ones don't, don't have any knobs. You know, again, they, there's no logic to their story. Um, it seems to be some kind of energetic function, but what specifically, I don't know. Some people think it almost looks like um, an extrusion machine. You know, how they make plastic products now. <laughs> you know, who knows? That's, that's one of the biggest enigmas are these knobs because you find them in many different locations around the world. You find them in India, you find them in Turkey, you find them in Egypt, you know, all over the place. Well, clearly it points to the fact that they had a very specific reason why they did all the things they did. It wasn't random. Like when we think of as, oh, this civilization built here because of their access to water. But, but look at places like Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, built at, well, built at 11, 11, elevation up there near you at 11,000 feet in a place that has you know, very sparse um, water and food. It's very hostile conditions to live up there. So clearly, the purpose of them building had nothing to do with their access to you know, being able to just, just grow crops and just create a civilization. It was more of a specific location on the planet that they needed to build them at rather than having all of these necess necessary things available around them, which really begs the question of if they knew that that was as important to do as they did. I mean, some of the feats involved in this requiring traveling 400 to perhaps a thousand miles away to get these blocks that we have no idea how they even lifted. And then you, you like you mentioned, all like Tombo, these stones like are in, in back of me that are taken off the top of a mountain stones that are over 50 tons each. This was all very deliberate. This was all done as in like there was a grand plan needed here. So the question is, if that was 13,000 years ago, roughly, that these cataclysms happened that led to the destruction of these civilizations and the, a lot of the destruction we find on the structures themselves, it means that we know they were built before. But, but really what the, the ultimate question I want to ask you as we conclude here is, here we are 12 to 13,000 years later, and we're finding a lot of increased volcanism and geologic act, uh, activity going on around the world. And we're seeing nor the North Pole shifting and they're flying up there in aircraft and trying to reevaluate where the true North is. Are we in another one of these cycles now? And, and this isn't a fear-based question. It's just a realistic question. You know, what do you see for our future of these changes? Are we going to learn le the necessary lessons needed to be able to reach the next step? Or are we going to disappear just like these past civilizations have? I think we're going to disappear because it'll, it'll come with no warning and it'll be moving possibly at the speed of light. So um, I very much, you know, we're, we're within the time window, but it could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. I don't think it's going to happen in, in our lifetimes, but um, Again, according to Paul Laviolette, it's a cycle of, every, and the same with um, Robert Schock, it's a cycle of every 13,000 years, plus or minus, uh, that, this, that uh, a destructive series of events happen. So I think, yeah, we, one is coming, but yeah, I wouldn't be fearful of it. Um, but, uh, you know, and I hope it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. But. <laughs>
as well. Is there any chance that, you know, with some of the, the whispers and seek in the secrets of some of the technology that we may or may not have, um, potentially some of the strange visitations to the North and South pole and some of the interest in Antarctica. Do you think that there is potentially an attempt to try to prevent this? Is this a known thing? And is it possible that in your opinion, that technology that we have present could potentially prevent maybe not all of the, solar outburst, outburst destruction that could that could happen on the planet but what about preventing a full pole shift um no i don't th- i i think we're at the at the whim of the un- the forces of the universe and um you know people in the know and people with tremendous wealth are either building underground or they're or they're moving to um you know very rural locations in order to be able to cover their own asses i guess but for the general population, it's like, nope, you know, it'll happen. And, and uh, that'll be just a, another stage in the story of, um, of life on earth. You know, Incredible. I'm, I'm just, here. yeah, I'm, 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 I'm simply glad that we do have these ancient megalithic structures to be able to study because, um, you know, they, they tell us that uh, what the capability was and potentially could be uh, in the future. All right, Brian, la- last question uh, for you, and it's a quick one. Do you think within your lifetime that the the paradigm of lost civilizations in our ancient history and accepting megalithic structures as being from an earlier culture, do you think that this paradigm is going to change within, within your or my lifetime? Um, or do you think that it's going to remain um, sort of in the background? Well, I think more and more people are waking up to it, not the, you know, not the general population, because most people, when they visit ancient locations, they simply want to be told a story. So if the guide says Machu Picchu was built by the Inca, then everyone just goes, oh, okay. You know, they don't, they're not shown the, megal- the difference between the megalithic aspect and the Inca aspect. Um, but every time I go to Machu Picchu now, uh, the local, some of the local guides do come up to me and say, I've been watching your videos and I had no idea that there was a difference in construction technique, but now I know. And that's what I tell the people when they come to visit. So that's, that's more of what I want to do than anything else. Originally it was to try to wake up the population in general, but not now I would like it. Um, or I like the fact that I'm being able to influence local, you know, guides, of the complexity of the nature of the things that they show people. That's, you know, I'm very happy about that. That to me, that means my job isn't necessarily done, but it means that I don't uh, carry the burden of having to (laughs) to be the only one doing this kind of stuff. And of course there are other great um, channels like Bright Insight and uh, Uncharted X and many others. Um, The Lost History Channel, like there are many, 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 uh, YouTube channels now that are, are talking about the same thing. So that's, that's wonderful. The more of those there are, then uh, the better for all of us. Yeah. And that's um, one of the main focuses of my channel as well. And the more channels and more individuals we can get that show this and point it out to the public, like you said, the more we can slowly influence um, a change of mind that eventually will become overwhelming to have us relook at this in a really serious way and, and potentially rewrite our entire history book. Um, Brian, yeah. I, I just want to say, I, I want to thank you for all of the dedication and hard work you have, you're doing around the world on all these sites. Um, you've, you've changed my perspective. It really helped clarity in, 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 in my own perspective of looking at ancient history and lost civilizations. And I want to say just thank you to all those people that, that feel the same way as I do. And also for coming on the show today and having this great discussion um, can you go, go ahead and tell everybody where they can find your work um, and, and maybe even just end out and just to letting people know some of these future visits and, and projects that you're working on? Sure. Well, everything is basically at my website, which is hiddenincatours.com. And, you know, links to the, all the, like I've got 1,470 videos now or something like that. And uh, like 97% of, of the website has free information because that's my main uh, job is to you know is to share the share what I learned with the world you know there is a commercial angle to it as well and like the books and the tours um, you know 
the tours are presently on hold because of, <laughs> because of what we're all going through. I uh, have no idea when, uh, for example, the Lima International Airport's going to open again. They keep delaying it. But uh, I'm, still, you know, I'm still planning on, on doing tours in Egypt and Peru and Bolivia, once in a while Easter Island, uh, you know, once every five years go to Turkey maybe and uh, Baalbek and um, Petra, places like that. And uh, I'd like to go to India once, but again, who knows when that's going to happen. So that's, that's where people can find, uh, find basically everything that I've done and uh, everything I will be doing will be. Uh, I keep adding new posts to my, my website um, as time goes on. So that's where it all is. Certainly a lot to look forward to. Um, I'm, I'm always excited for new videos that you, that you put up. Always something new to learn. So uh, I just want to say my, I truly appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you for coming on today. Uh, this has been uh, episode number eight of Mastermind Discussions with Brian Forrester. Until next time.